today we have a selection of the most unusual and exciting discoveries that you definitely don't want to miss. The oldest forms of life are possible. Researchers have found something in rocks two billion years old, and it has signs of a living organism. Physicists seem to have confirmed the existence of negative time, a very strange phenomenon in a very strange experiment. Mushroom animals, it turns out, understand a thing or two about the cosmic web. Astrophysicists have learned how to use genius teardrops. The hunt for immortality stem cells have cured the most severe type of diabetes. Also revolutionary drugs for schizophrenia. And bestiary, two complex creatures merge into one. Even nervous systems. A startling discovery that offers a chance at a brain transplant. And let's start with the discovery of what are, by many accounts, mysterious ancient life forms. They may have remained intact for a couple of billion years. All that time inside volcanic rocks, isolated not just from the outside world, but as if trapped in that moment in history. When something happens on Earth and it goes from a seething inferno from boiling oceans of erupting volcanoes to an icy inferno for hundreds of millions of years, and at that point, they get trapped in the mineral rocks where they stay until they're discovered by microbiologists. And these are not fossils and other dead traces, but seem to be the oldest cells and perhaps even living, almost untouched by evolution. As the leader of the study specifies, without too much modesty, so far the oldest rocks in which microorganisms have been found are sediments under the seabed 100 million years old. We already knew that microbes are able to evolve using something in the rocks themselves. Such isolated cells can take thousands or even millions of years to divide. There was really no hurry in their prison, and rushing would be too wasteful of the extremely limited resources locked up. Usually when resources run out, such cells fall into a kind of hibernation, anabiosis, and can come back to life when more favorable conditions appear. But here, of course, is the big question that immediately arises for the most vigilant skeptics. How can we be sure that the microbes we've found are really ancient life forms and not introduced into the samples we've collected, modern microbes. What's interesting here is that Yuhei Suzuki, the lead author of the study, is an astrobiologist himself. He's long been looking for ways to discover extraterrestrial life on, say, Mars, where the same igneous rocks as in the latest study abound. The Mars rover Perseverance, for example, has collected samples of the same, roughly the same, type and age. And separate missions are set to bring them back to Earth. And inside the rocks may be, as Suzuki dreams, not just footprints, but surviving Martian microbes. So the professor is looking for the oldest inhabitants of the Earth to understand how to work with real Martians, when or if they manage to find them for what, and comes up with ways to make such a discovery reliable and convincing. After all, not all of the professor's work has been received optimistically so far. He has already found living microbes in rocks 100 million years old. Doubts arise, first of all, because of too high probability of contamination when collecting rocks during their study at any moment. And it is expensive, time-consuming, and difficult to test independently. This time, Professor Suzuki and his team weren't taking any chances. They went big and deep into South Africa's Bushveld complex, a geologist's dream and the planet's largest known platinum deposit. Two-thirds of the world's platinum comes from here, along with gold, chromium, nickel, basically Earth's bling vault. It's vast, about the size of Ireland, and more importantly for the researchers, geologically ancient and eerily untouched. The oldest lava-formed basalts in the region have barely shifted in two billion years. Perfect conditions, they thought, for ancient microbial life to not just fossilize, but survive. They didn't need to drill far, just 15 meters deep, but this time they brought in a clever trick. Microspheres in the drilling fluid, tiny glowing markers that mimic cells and light up under ultraviolet. If any cracks existed in the rock, these would sneak in too. If no microspheres showed up, the path was clean, and that's exactly what happened. Pristine. Then came the innovation. Instead of crushing the rock like in earlier studies, they sliced it into translucent 3 millimeter layers. The inner contents remained sealed, but finely visible. And what did they find? Clay-filled veins packed with organic material, resembling microbial cells. 
To check for life, the biologist turned to a special dye, one that only seeps through microscopic pores and binds exclusively to DNA. And then it lit up. The material inside the rock fluoresced, signaling the presence of DNA. Advanced microscopy and spectroscopy confirmed the structure, but here's where it gets weird. Even dead cells would produce a similar signal, so maybe these aren't alive. But here's what breaks the brain. The oldest DNA ever found, until now, is about 1-2 million years old. This stuff is 2 billion years old. The researchers believe that due to the unique chemistry of the basalt, some microbes may have survived, literally maintained biological function across a geological timescale. Imagine, life so slow and dormant it outlasts continents shifting. But here's the catch. No one's opening these veins yet. The team doesn't even know how to safely release what's inside, or how to ensure they're not unleashing contamination or mistaking modern microbes for ancient ones. So for now, the mystery holds. Is it life? Is it ancient? Is it even Earth's? No one knows yet, but one thing's certain. We're watching Suzuki's work very closely. And right now, we have time travel. No, seriously, in a real quantum experiment, physicists stumbled upon something they're calling negative time. That's when an event seems to happen before it actually happens. Sounds like science fiction? Like something that should shatter the laws of physics? You're not wrong. It looks like something faster than light, like the arrow of time is breaking, like the future is whispering into the past. But once you dig into the details, it doesn't get any less strange. It just gets... Deeper. Let's rewind. The idea for this mind-bending experiment started seven years ago, when Professor Ephraim Steinberg and his team at the University of Toronto decided to explore how light, good old photons, interacts with matter. A simple question, they thought, so they turned to an atomic classic, excited atoms. Here's the setup. A photon zips through a gas, gets absorbed by an atom, kicks the atom's electron into a higher energy state, and eventually the atom relaxes, spitting out a new photon. Pretty basic physics, or so it seemed. The weirdness kicks in when you try to measure the group lag time, the time between a photon going in and a photon coming out. The team wanted to know, does this transit time depend on what actually happens to the photon inside the atomic cloud? Was it absorbed and re-emitted? Did it just pass through without interaction or something in between? sound straightforward? That's what they thought too, until they asked around. Everyone had their own hunch, Steinberg recalls, but there was no consensus. No expert had the definitive answer. That meant only one thing, build the experiment. Three years of prep, ultra-cold rubidium atoms near absolute zero, the cleanest, most precise laser pulses, equipment tuned to measure the tiniest disturbances in atomic energy. And then they ran it, and what they saw broke everything. Sometimes the photons passed untouched, but the rubidium atoms were still excited, and as long as if they had absorbed these photons. Even more surprisingly, when the photons were absorbed, they seemed to re-emit almost instantaneously, long before the rubidium atoms returned to the ground state. It was as if the photons, on average, left the atoms faster than they should have. What was even going on here? That was now the big question. The researchers had no explanation. None. The results from the first experiment didn't just challenge theory, they detonated it. So they called for backup. Quantum theorists, experts in the weirdest corners of physics, and together they started to piece together a picture that made some sense if you're willing to stretch your mind into places it's never been, they realize something wild. The time the photon spent inside the atom, as energy, as pure excitation, matched the group delay time. Even in cases where the photon seemed to re-emerge before the atom had time to settle back down. You heard that right. The particle left before the atom even finished reacting to it. And if you're confused, you're not alone. So were the physicists who designed the experiment. Even they admit it. This doesn't make any damn sense. But let's take a step back. Imagine photons not as tidy little particles, but as smudges of probability. Fuzzy, ghostly blurs moving through space-time. Not fixed, not solid, 
They don't hit atoms. They merge into possibilities. And the atoms themselves? Just as fuzzy. The photon can be absorbed or not. Readmitted or not. Delayed or instantaneous. It's a dice roll every time. And on a quantum level, that means you can't mark one single time. You get a spread, a spectrum, like hands on a blurred out clock face, ticking not just forward, but sometimes backward. That's where the negative time shows up, not in the universe itself, but in the math describing how these blurred quantum clocks behave. And when they plugged this weird math into predictions, it said something no one expected. If we run this again, our quantum clock should sometimes tick backward. The researchers were stunned. One of them said we double-checked the equations and couldn't believe it, but the math held. So they did what any good physicist would do. They built a second experiment to test the insanity. And the results? It worked. Exactly as predicted. Here's what they saw. There are two ways a photon can travel through the atomic cloud. In the first, it slaps on metaphorical blinders and ignores everything, just zips through, not even noticing the atoms. In the other case, the photon interacts with the atom, and here's a very subtle point which the researchers themselves are well aware of and take into account. Here's how team leader Steinberg explains it. When you see a photon coming out of a cloud, you can't know which of the two options you're dealing with. The measuring device ends up in a superposition of measuring zero and measuring some small positive value. But it also means that sometimes the measuring device ends up in a state that looks not like zero plus something positive, but zero minus something positive, which results in what looks like the wrong sign, a negative value for that atomic excitation period. That is, it follows from these measurements that photons moved through the gas faster when they excited the atoms than when they flew at all, without being distracted by such encounters. And it seems to be a paradox, but not really. As the researchers themselves say, now we know that if we build a quantum clock to measure how long atoms are in the excited state, the conditional hand of such a clock at some moments will move backward, not forward. And this is important to realize. Not time itself moves backwards, but the hand of such a clock moves backwards, sometimes, because the clock is also a very important part of this system and a participant in the process. The results seem to have interested other physicists very much, although our understanding of the nature of time is not changed by this study. But we got a discovery that allows us to make significant progress in quantum photonics. And this will be useful in quantum communication, in quantum computing. It will be useful anywhere in such a strange and wonderful quantum mechanics. And now, brace yourself. We dive into something way simpler than quantum time reversal, yet somehow just as mind-bending. A study linking slime molds to the cosmic web. Yes, actual brainless blobs. Those gelatinous mushroom animals and the largest structure in the entire universe. Let's start with the basics. The cosmic web is the vastest structure we know of. It's made up of galaxies, gas, and that mysterious gravitational ghost we call dark matter. These components stretch out across the cosmos like an intricate network binding everything together in a filamentary structure that's so immense we've never seen it all. And here's the catch. We can't. We only see fragments. Galaxies grouped here, empty voids there. It's like trying to guess the layout of a whole city when all you can see are a few isolated rooftops. We simulate the rest, computer-generated models based on sparse observations. But even our best simulations feel like squinting in the dark. Enter. Slime molds. No, not literally. No one dumped amoebae into space, but a young astrophysicist digging through obscure biology papers found inspiration in a legendary experiment. Slime molds once mapped the Tokyo subway system with eerie efficiency. Scientists placed food at city nodes, stations, and the molds spread out, connecting the dots in the most efficient way possible. Not magic. The scientists helped a little. But still, these simple, neuralist organisms solved complex spatial puzzles better than many algorithms. So the astrophysicist wondered, what if the same logic that governs how slime molds find food could help us find galaxies? Could a slime mold strategy reveal the hidden skeleton of the universe? He built a simulation 
a method called the Monte Carlo Fizerum machine. It treats slime molds as autonomous agents, tiny digital blobs moving through space, all driven by the same rule, head toward food. But in this case, food meant galaxies and dark matter halos. Each digital slime cell moves with a bit of its own chaotic personality, but they all obey the same instinct, and together they weave a network. And here's the shock. It worked, not just a little. The resulting model didn't just replicate known galactic structures. It unveiled new filaments, subtle connections, and previously undetected threads in the cosmic web that standard simulations had missed. The algorithm outperformed state-of-the-art astrophysics in detailing the cosmic skeleton of the universe. Now, this is purely mathematic, but the next step is astronomical. The structures this method predicts, if they're real, should show up in future telescope data. If they do, it'll be the ultimate validation, because then we'll know. Somewhere in the way slime molds solve mazes, the universe solves itself. And suddenly, the dumbest creature on Earth might have something to teach us about the smartest structure in the cosmos. Let's take a little break from eternity and look at something far more personal and immediate, our bodies. Because right now, at the edge of biology, medicine is hunting for something very old and very human. Immortality. For the first time ever, scientists may have cured the most severe form of type 1 diabetes, not managed, not delayed, cured, and not with donor cells or transplants, but with reprogrammed stem cells taken from the patient herself. Just three months after the procedure, her body began producing insulin again. She eats sugar. She lives free from the daily threat of a coma. A full year has passed, and now, only now, researchers are ready to speak. The disease is gone. No complications. No side effects. The magic? It wasn't CRISPR or gene editing in the usual sense, but chemical induction, a subtle manipulation of gene expression. Other patients are already in line for trials. If this result holds, it's not a fluke. It's the beginning of a therapy that could change everything. But that's just the start. The respected and cautious journal Nature, a place where every sentence is weighted, just called a new treatment for schizophrenia revolutionary. It's the first drug in a decade with a completely different mechanism of action. And it doesn't just ease symptoms, it actually improves cognition. Early reports are jaw-dropping. Yes, it's still expensive, about $20,000 a year. And yes, you have to take it every other day, but it's real, tangible. Lives are already changing. And while that unfolds, a convoy of microbots is helping surgeons do something even more sci-fi, perform delicate operations without making incisions. They're called train bots. Miniature robots just three millimeters long, linked together like a flexible train. They're guided by magnets, and their tiny molybdenum legs grip the soft tissue inside the human body. They don't slice through. You don't even need to make new opening. They wind their way through your body's natural curves to reach organs once thought unreachable without risk. A catheter or electrode rides along this robotic train, finally delivering surgical tools to places where no single device could reach before. And then there's the bestiary. Today's entry, a discovery that seems torn from mythology, two sea creatures, jellyfish-like comb jellies fused into one, completely, not metaphorically, not conjoined twins. These were two unrelated individuals that merged into a single organism, sharing one nervous system, reacting to stimuli in perfect synchrony, the muscles moved together, signals flowed between once separate brains, even the digestive tracts merged. Two mouths, but one body. It shouldn't be possible. The immune system is designed to reject what's foreign. That's why organ transplants are so complex. That's why brain transplants are still science fiction. But these sea walnuts? They skipped all that. They ignored the friend or foe mechanism and simply became one. Why? We don't know. They're ancient some of the most primitive multicellular animals. Maybe their simplicity is the key, but if we can understand how they overcome rejection, we might learn to do it too. Turn off the immune trigger, merge two nervous systems, and maybe, just maybe, we could one day transplant the human brain. We'll be keeping an eye on those crested sea creatures, and we'll keep watching every thread in this wild hunt for immortality. And you, you make it possible by liking, watching, commenting, and questioning. That's how we move forward.
together.